topic that I've titled The Porter and the Clay. The Porter and the Clay. Amen. Um, for those that know me, there's a prayer that I always pray. Oftentimes I'll pray it in vigils or somewhere. And I'll pray that the Lord should open my eyes, should open our eyes to see ourselves, you know, the way the Lord sees us. If you remember that, the reason is this. Your perspective, the lens through which you see the world, the lens through which you see life and that you see your own self is very crucial to the fulfillment of your God-given destiny or the abortion of a God-given destiny. I hope you are listening. The lens through which you see the world and through which you see yourself is very crucial to the fulfillment or abortion of your God-given destiny. Now, the reason I'm deliberately using the word God-given destiny is that it's possible for a man to carve out his own own destiny the way he wants. And some people, in fact, are not interested in a God-given destiny. You know, you hear people say, I make my own path in this life. I choose my own destiny. And yes, because God has given you will, you can actually choose your own destiny, the path that you want to follow. So this sermon, this teaching this morning is principally for those that are interested in fulfilling their God-given destiny. So if you view yourself, if you look at yourself and your life only through the eyes and the lens of your ambitions, the things you want to achieve, the dreams you had, you know, as a young man, I want to be an astronaut, I want to live in the space station and so on and so forth. And believe me, those are very beautiful things. There's nothing wrong with you wanting that, if you understand where I'm coming from. But you see, there are those that want to be an astronaut but the Lord has called you to be a musician, you know, to, has called you to be a worshiper, but you want to be an astronaut. And there are those today that they are pilots, or you know, and that there's something else that the Lord has designed in his mind for them. And they could go on to become, in fact, one of the most fantastic pilots. But this morning, what I'm talking about is not a destiny, is those that are interested in fulfilling their God-given destiny. To see themselves the way God sees them. This morning, I want to show you a dimension of God's perspective, how God views you and views your destiny, and to give you a realistic, um, should I say realistic timeline or progression or how things work from God's perspective. The title is The Potter and the Clay. Now, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 to 6. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 to 6. The Lord said to prophet Jeremiah something very powerful, very simple. So it starts by saying, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah, and this is the message. He said, Go down to the porter's shop, and I will speak to you there. Stay with me. So God wanted to teach Jeremiah something. He wanted to show Jeremiah something. But the Lord said, I won't do it here, because you won't get the picture. Go to the porter's house or the porter's shop. I want to show you something when I show you that thing, then you understand the message I'm trying to pass across to you. So he did. He got there. He says, so I did as he told me. And I found the porter walking at his will. 
verse 4. He says, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. Is somebody still with me? He says, the jar that the potter was making did not turn out as the potter had hoped. He says, so he crushed it into a lump of clay again and it started over. Are you following? Verse 5. He says, then the Lord gave me this message. So this was what God wanted to tell Jeremiah. But God saw that for Jeremiah to understand it, he wanted to give him a visual perspective to it. So he says, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So God is talking to Israel, his people, you and I. He says, can I not do to you as this potter has done? Can I not mold you into what I want? Can I not take your life and use it to do what I choose? Now, this is the hard thing for man to realize. You and I, we are like clay. (laughs) This is difficult to sink in for a man. You and I. We are like clay. You know why it's difficult for us to often accept this? Because you have abilities. You can get up and just go do whatever you want to do. Right? Without caring what God thinks. For instance, you could choose not to be in church this morning. You could choose to be doing anything, whatever you want. But you've tried. By God's grace, he's brought you here. But then what happens on Monday? What happens on Tuesday? What happens on Wednesday? When God says, I want to mold your life into what I choose. And oftentimes, we're not interested. We want to do our own thing. But God says, no, that's, that's not how I want it. And he reiterates it again. And I'm going somewhere. He reiterates it again in Isaiah 29, verse 15 to 16. He reiterates the truth again. He says, what sorrow awaits those who try to hide their plans from the Lord? Who do their evil deeds in the dark? People that go on their own tangent and say, the Lord can't see us. They say, he doesn't know what's going on. He says, how foolish can you be? He is the potter. And he is certainly greater than you, the clay. So God is reiterating here that you are the clay. And he is the potter. Now, the thing I want to bring out here, first of all, as we go on, is that Every time God talks about you and I as the clay, he never talks about you throughout the scriptures. He never ever called man the clay alone. He's always in relation to the potter. It's always the potter and the clay. He never calls himself the potter alone. I never calls you the clay alone. You would always see the reference, the Lord linking them together. A unique relationship between the potter and the clay. And you'd see this actually in over about four or five books of the scripture. With about three different authors in the scripture. And the Lord deliberately uses this analogy of the potter and the clay. With different Different authors. So the Holy Spirit consistently over time keeps referring to this relationship between man and God 
as the relationship between clay and the potter. So it tells you something that if you really want to understand a dimension of how God sees you and the relationship with himself, you need to look deeper at the relationship between the potter and the clay. And so this morning, this is the, uh, should I say, the relationship I want to uh, elucidate. I want to throw more light on this morning. Amen. Okay. The potter has... Okay, I don't know why you're laughing, but anyway. The potter has the responsibility. Looking at that relationship, it's a unique relationship. The potter has the responsibility of turning the clay into a masterpiece. Stay with me. It's not the responsibility of the clay to turn itself into a masterpiece. That's why the scripture says it is not of man in himself to know his own way. It is not of you, the clay, to become a masterpiece by your own struggles and labor. No, that's, that's God's job. That's the potter's job. Right? Is someone excited that it's God's responsibility to, to, to turn you to a masterpiece? That you don't have to uh, be the one to do that job. But then you still have to ask yourself, what's the responsibility of the clay? Or what does the clay have to do in this thing? You may say it's just a lump of clay. What can he do? The properties, the inherent properties of clay. In fact, as I mean, I'm no expert pottery maker by any standard, um, but as I began to study this further, I realized that there are several types of clay. Several types of clay. And I found that the properties of the clay determines what the potter can do with it. The malleability of the clay, how, how bendable, how flexible the clay is, determines what the potter can do with it, what he can achieve with that clay. The degree of impurities in the clay also has a lot to do with the usefulness of the clay. When the potter, no matter how excellent a potter is, if he picks up a lump of clay that is filled with all sorts of tiny stones, impurities, dirt, and so on, no matter how skillful he is, that clay can't become a masterpiece. The clay needs to ensure that it in itself is a pure lump that is moldable, malleable, soft enough, the right texture. You see, without impurities, then when the potter lays hold of it and says, wow, nice lump of clay, Let's begin to work with this one. And then, imagine God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's nothing he cannot do. So when he finds a lump of clay that is beautiful, he says, I'm going to get to work on this lump. There are at least four steps involved in making of a masterpiece, a pottery. I mean, they can, they can break this, uh, should I say, uh, potter's, break this down into a lot more. But I've just taken, I found that there are four basic steps that are involved, four of them. Now, these four steps, they cannot be achieved in a day. Cannot. It's a process that takes time. Why am I showing you this this morning? Some people think the fulfillment of destiny, God is not moving quickly enough. For them, 
the things they want to achieve, the dreams they want to achieve, the things they want to do, God is too slow. Go and ask any porter. After you do some things with the clay, you have to let the clay stand and dry. You have to leave it there for a while. You must give it time. You see, to fulfill your destiny, it will take time. It's not going to happen that, Lord, I'm born again today, tomorrow, take me to the throne. No. (laughs) Anybody that has preached such a sermon to you, go back and look at the scripture, the potter and the clay. God says it's the potter, you are the clay. The first step is called forming the pot. Or in some perspectives, they call it throwing the clay. But I'll just use forming the pot. Uh, Media, I apologize. I'm going to throw a spanner in your works, but um, please just stay with me. You see, this forming the pot, this is where God forms the basic part of your destiny, where he reveals the form of your purpose to you. So if you are here in this room, you already know what God has called you to be. You already know that this is the destiny that he has for me. This is who I'm supposed to be. But I'm just at the beginning stage. Then you're probably at the forming the pot stage. Amen. And that's why if you go back to um, eighteen uh, Jeremiah 18 verse 3 to 4. Uh, Jeremiah 18, verse 3 to 4. So he says, so I did as he told me and found the potter walking at his wheel. This is where God is walking. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. And he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. So this is where God picks you up and says, I want to turn this guy into this thing. And so God starts up there. Now, Adam, for instance, <clears throat> excuse me, Adam was someone that God intended to be the God of this world. So when God made him, that was the idea. That was what God was forming him to be, to be the God of this world, the first man. He named all the animals to rule and everything. But Adam said, As the clay in the potter's hand, he didn't turn out as the Lord hoped. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want to conform to this shape that you are bending me to. I'm not so much interested in this relationship with you. I'd rather listen to the devil, to the serpent, to my wife that tells me to do what you said I shouldn't do. And so he couldn't fit the original mold that God had for him. Stay with me this morning. And so God had to crush him back and start again. And so God said, well, if I can't make you the God of this world, if I can't make you into this wonderful, the head and all that, well, if you can't afford to wear my glory as clothes, and you, you chose to pick leaves and so on. So God said, well, he killed an animal and made some coverings for him and sent him out of the garden that God intended for him to tend and take care so that, well, let's make him into something else at least. And so we see Abraham, um, we see Adam as the father of the earth and things like that, but no longer the original version that the potter had in mind. We see the same thing in the life of Esau. Esau was the firstborn. The birthright, the blessing of the firstborn belonged to him. Today, we know God as God of 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau because the blessing of the firstborn belonged to him. But the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, it says, make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. So his destiny as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, he traded it for a meal. He said, I'm not interested in what you want to form me into. He said, what is the bad right to me? What is my God-given destiny to me? I really don't care about that. Just give me some food and take, take it. Let me tell you, we don't know this, but the truth is many of us were throwing away our God-given destinies for peanuts, for things that don't matter. Sometimes people give up their destinies for fornication, for the pleasure of sin. God says, come, I'll make you into this. And he says, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. And he chooses something else over that. There was the rich young ruler that Jesus loved so much and said, come, follow me to be one of the apostles. I'm sure you've heard me preach that sermon here before. The 13th disciple that never was. I remember that's the title. The 13th disciple that never was. The same thing Jesus said to Apostle Peter, to Apostle James, to Apostle John. Come, follow me. Jesus doesn't say, follow me to everybody. But he said it to this young man. But the scripture says, but because he had a lot of money and possession and he couldn't give up his love and hunger for money, for his destiny that Jesus called him for. So he gave it up. And so the Lord could not mold him into what the Lord wanted. He created a different destiny for himself. If you read the book of Revelation, it talks about the name of the apostles being in heaven. Is it on the gate or on the foundations in heaven? That guy's name would have been part of the names of the foundations of the new Jerusalem. That was the destiny that Jesus wanted to carve out for him, but he didn't want it. You see, the, the, the painful thing is that we looked at someone like Esau. Well, since he didn't want that, the Lord crushed him back and made him into someone else. We know that Esau was still wealthy. Um, he had 400 bodyguards, and um, he had a city named after him, Edom, and so on, even though we don't know where Edom is today. But, well, he, he took something lesser than what God wanted for him. Are you following me? You have to check yourself and ask yourself, am I taking what God wants for me, or have I carved out a destiny for myself? Has God called you to do something? Is God telling you, drop this character, drop this habit, and you're like, no, this is too sweet, this is too good, I can't give it up. And you're choosing something else, and the potter is saying, well, if you can't, maybe I'll have to crush you back and see what we can make you into. I'm telling you this morning, this is, this is from my heart. And um, as, I, as I prepared this, it was a solemn moment for me because I began to think about my own life. I began to think, Lord, where, where am I? 
Have I been crushed back? Have I given up a part of my destiny? Have I, you know, things like that. You have to ask yourself those questions. But at least with Adam, with Esau, he remolded those ones into something else. There are those that painfully cannot even be remolded. Their case is so bad that the Lord has to say, you know what, just throw this lump of clay away. This is, this is the truth, but painful. 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 11. The story of Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 11. The scripture says, then the Lord said to Samuel, anytime I read this scripture, I don't know, I, I always have to pause because it, it's so touching. It says, then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. He says, I am sorry. In fact, another version says, and the Lord repented. He says, he repented me that I ever made Saul king. He says, for he has not, verse 11, he says, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. So everything the potter was trying to do to mold him, to blend him into something, he will break. They will bend him into this. He will break. The Lord had told him, wait for Samuel to come. He disobeyed that. Go to the Amalekite. Wipe out the... He disobeyed. Everywhere it was just... It got to a point the Lord said, Samuel, I can't, I can't walk with this clay anymore. He said, I can't walk with this clay anymore. It says, but Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. It pained Samuel so much. He cried to the Lord all night. Even the clay that they've rejected did not know. It was someone else that was crying for him. He had no idea. He thought life was still all good. Okay, I said, even the clay did not know that he had been rejected. The Lord had rejected King Saul. Yes, he's the clay. The Lord is the potter. The Lord said, I repent. He says, I am sorry that I made, I ever made Saul king. So the Lord said, this clay that I was working to be a fantastic king. He says, it's useless. I can't work with this clay anymore. Samuel was so deeply moved. When he heard it, he cried all night. In fact, if you remember a scripture earlier, somewhere, in, just stay there, the Samuel had said to Saul, I think that, that would have been chapter 13 of First Samuel. He said, he said to, Samuel said to Saul, he said, you have done foolishly. He says, for now your kingdom will end. He said, for before you would have had a kingdom that would not have ended. He says, but now your kingdom must end. And by 15, he did another goof. And at this point, the potter said, I can't walk with this clay anymore. Samuel was still crying for Saul. But 1 Samuel 16, 1. 1 Samuel 16, 1. The Lord said to Samuel. Now the Lord said to Samuel. He says, you have mourned long enough for Saul. He says, you've cried long enough for this clay. He says, seeing I have rejected him as king of Israel. I'm done with this clay. I can't use this clay anymore. He says, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. He says, find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Basically, I have found myself another lump of clay that I can use. I'm done with that lump. 
that lump is useless. There's too many stones and impurities and rocks. I can't work with that clay anymore. He says, I found myself another lump of clay. He said, Samuel, hurry up. And so Samuel went. It's very painful, but that's the truth. The next stage, the second stage, is called the trimming and refining. The trimming and the refining. You see, after the Lord makes you, molds you, the forming of the pot in the first stage, you're not there yet. He's only formed you into what he wants you to do like Adam. You haven't fulfilled the destiny yet. That's just the beginning. And then comes the trimming and the refining stage. You know, at that, this, this stage is often a bit cozy. Amen? It's often a bit nice, the, the, the stage of trimming. And, you know, because you're already seeing the shape of your destiny. Paradventure, you've been called to be a pastor. You know, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And the Lord has given you uh, a congregation, a small, and you're already teaching, you're already preaching, and everyone's already saying, oh, pastor, pastor, and it looks good. Hallelujah. But you're far. You're not yet there. You're not yet where the Lord is taking you to. There comes the trimming and the refining. Where the Lord takes you through things. Where he grows you, you know, as it were, in the trimming stage. So you see, after Saul anointed David, sorry, after Samuel anointed David as king, and then he went through trimming. How did he go through refining and trimming? He was only a boy at the back of the desert who was going to be king. So he had to go through apprenticeship. So the Lord sent him under the same soul that had been rejected, who had no idea what was going on. You see, I always tell people one of the most dangerous things is you don't know what you lose with God when you disobey. You don't know. God is not going to typically come to you and say, because yesterday I told you to do this, you didn't do it. See what I've taken from you. No, he usually doesn't do that. He doesn't say, I told you not to like it. Yesterday you did it. See, I won't show you again. No, he doesn't. You, you just stay where you are. You don't know what you've lost. You've gone to fornicate. You cleaned your mouth. And if you remember what we read in um, Isaiah 29, he says, how foolish. Isaiah 29, 15, he says, What sorrow awaits those who try to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their evil deeds in the dark? He says, The Lord can't see us, they say. I've done it, I've cleaned my mouth, I've committed fornication, nobody sees me. You clean your body and then you come to church. He says, The Lord can't see me, he doesn't know what's going on. He says, How foolish can you be? He is the potter. He's the potter. He's the one molding you. He knows everything. The Lord said, don't do this. Don't do that. You just do just. He knows. What are you saying? He knows everything. It's total surrender. The clay must be absolutely malleable in the hand. Of the potter. Any impurity in that lump of clay, he will know. You can't hide the impurity in the clay from the potter. The moment it begins to work it at the wheel, the impurity will show up. And so, he took David through trimming, refining, under Saul, who had no idea that he'd been rejected, everything is gone and lost. He didn't know that the person that was taking over from him, he's the one that's mentoring that one. Because David now needed to understand royal administration. He needed to learn leadership. He needed to learn royalty. He needed to learn how to eat with, you know, maybe fork and knife in the palace and those kind of things as a king. So now he had a place in Saul's house, at Saul's table. 
That's where the Lord was trimming him, correcting those ones, you know, fine-tuning him and everything. But you see, the refining process itself doesn't come without its challenges. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, he married the king's daughter, and life was good, as it were. Oftentimes, when we go through the refining process, it's beautiful. But then, and this is what you need to understand as the clay. Because some Christians go through things and they wonder, where is the Lord? The Lord has for, forgotten me. I've been praying. This is not. You're just going through the process as the clay. The third stage after the trimming and the refining is called the bisque firing. <laughs> B-I-S-Q-U-E, the bisque firing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bisque firing is the process where after they've trimmed, you know, and they've refined it, they now take that clay. It's already set in the ship. We already know that this is destiny. And they now take it and put it inside what they call a kiln. The kiln is an oven for burning, for heating <laughs> the clay. They heat the clay, give it heat, temperature to harden it, to solidify it. So inside the kiln, the, the clay is feeling the heat. But that heat is growing its strength. It's toughening it up. Amen. So the things that are happening to you and you're like, Lord, why me? You are in the bisque firing process. You may just be in the bisque firing. If the Lord doesn't take you through the bisque firing process, you can't become a masterpiece. It's, it doesn't work. And so David suddenly... From eating at the king's table, marrying the king's daughter, uh, you know, having himself over 1,000 uh, soldiers and is refining his processes. And, you know, I'm sure David must have cleaned up nicely now, uh, shaving his beards and all that and things like that. All of a sudden, the king starts to chase him, trying to kill him. His character, he starts to run for his life. He has to watch his back. And what's going on, Lord? I've not become unfaithful. I'm still faithful. I'm still serving you. But all this pressure is there. Lord, I'm still praying, but I haven't gotten that job. Lord, I'm still faithful, but I'm still struggling. People are looking at me and saying, oh, he's always after God, chasing God, serving God, but he's hungry. And people are saying, and the Lord is saying, don't worry. You're in the bisque firing process, learning to trust me when there's nothing. Learning to trust me even when all seems lost. He says, stay there. Stay the course. Unfortunately, yes, ma'am. Yes, the truth is you're going to go through the bisque firing process. <laughs> if you skip process, you don't get to destiny. Once you skip process, it would always show up in your life later. Some people crack in the kiln some pots, some pottery, in the heat of the kiln. They say, I can't do this anymore. And they crack and they give up. Well, they never ever become masterpieces. That's just the way it is. He's the potter, you are the clay. As long as you align, you get to purpose and destiny. If you don't, then... The journey gets truncated somewhere. You get to destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. But this is what you need to know. It's the reality. 
as a Christian. The Lord used this analogy in over four books in the Bible. He used it, prophet Isaiah used it, prophet Jeremiah used it, apostle Paul used it in Romans. The potter and the clay. It's in the book of Lamentations, the potter and the clay. If the Lord in heaven is speaking to different people in different generations and using the same analogy, he's trying to tell you something. That this is the relationship and this is the process you must go through to get to where I want to get you to. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah 43 verse 2, Isaiah 43 verse 2, it talks about when you pass through the fire, I will be with you. When you're in the kiln, in the oven, and it is burning, it says, I'm with you there. He didn't say, I will take you out. He says, the flames will not consume you. You will come out. Amen? Amen. But you will feel the heat of the flame. The reason is because it is necessary for the development of your character. See, Moses, life was good. And then when he began to realize his destiny, he was a deliverer before you know what's happening. Moses found himself being chased and his life, and he had to run. Now, the last, let me just move, let me move on quickly uh, because I can see that my time is fast, it's gone. The last stage is called the glazing. Hallelujah, glazing. Beautification. This is where gloss is added. Beauty is added to the pottery. But guess what? Glazing is done under serious fire. Even hotter than the bisque. <laughs> this is the process. If you stop at bisque firing, you come out as a, uh, what's it called? You come out as a pot that is usable. You're already good enough to be used to drink, to fetch, to do anything once you've come out from bisque firing. But you're not a masterpiece. You become a masterpiece after glazing. You know, when gloss, beauty, design, all that is added. But it's done under intense fire, way hotter than the bisque. It's also done in the kiln, but they just turn up the heat. <laughs> Hallelujah. So David, after the king starts chasing him with spear and this thing, and he's running for his life and all that, and he thought, how bad could it be? This guy is trying to kill me. Like, <laughs> uh, you don't realize, Kev Adulam is just coming. <laughs> and so comes Kev Adulam. From the palace where he was eating with the king, he goes off into the cave to live for 13 years. That's even worse than what he was experiencing before. Joseph was sold into slavery. He was in the house of Potiphar. It's bad enough that he was a slave there until they lied on him and he was sent into the prison. Moses had been trying to deliver his people. He killed the Egyptian. He was running. His people were saying, will you kill us too? He was running. And he ran to, not knowing that there was 40 years waiting for him at the back of the desert. If you're going to be a masterpiece, this is the process. The Lord says, I am the potter. You are the clay. This is the process that the clay goes through before it becomes a masterpiece. But after they have gone through all this heat, 40 years of growing their character, David was right there in Kevadulam. He had the opportunity to kill Saul. His character is tested. His personality is developed, grown. 
under heat. Joseph even helped a man back. He says, remember me. They forgot him. The character is developed and tested under intense heat. It's called the glazing process. But, this is the beautiful part. Of course, again, some people break at the glazing stage. They crack and they just keep them back at the bisque level. But if you stay the course of the glazing, from after glazing, the cup is set and put as a masterpiece to showcase to the world. The potter then brings it out of the kiln and showcases it to the world as a masterpiece. That's the reason why David went straight from Kevadulam to the throne. That's the reason why Moses went straight from the back of the desert to becoming God to Pharaoh, the deliverer of Israel, the leader, the greatest prophet. That's the same reason why Joseph went from the prison straight to the throne to become prime minister. Why? Because the potter has finished the glazing process. And the moment the potter finishes glazing, the next thing the potter does, he doesn't put that masterpiece at the back. No, he displays it for the world to see. So, as a Christian, you have to decide if you're going to fulfill your God-given destiny, there's no skipping process. He's the potter you are the clay. This is how it works. Lord, I can't take this anymore. This is the end. Ah, no, 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 this one. Ah. <laughs> it's either you want to stop where you are or you want to ask for grace to stay the course for you to fulfill destiny. That's the reason why James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4, quickly as I close, James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4. You, 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 you know, when you read the scripture, some things you don't understand, but when the Lord opens your eyes, it makes sense. James 1, 2 to 4, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. So stay in the kiln. Stay in the heat. Endure it. It says, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You are ready to be displayed at this point. As a masterpiece. The word of God is true. Don't let anybody deceive you. If you stay the course, the Lord will display you. Amen. Not he may. He will display you. He's the potter. You are the clay. The joy of the potter is to display his masterpiece that he's been working on. That's the joy of the potter. The potter did not create pots so he can put them under the shelf. No. He wants to display his works. Isaiah 64 verse 8. Isaiah 64 verse 8 repeats it again. He lets you understand again. Isaiah 64 verse 8 lets you know again. And yet, oh Lord, he says, you are our father. We are the clay. And you are the potter, we all are formed by your hand. He says it over and over. Don't think God has forgotten you. No. Just understand at what stage of the process you are. 2 Timothy 2, 20 to 21. 2 Timothy 2, 20 to 21. The Lord, as I close, the Lord says, in a wealthy home, 
Some utensils are made of gold and silver. Some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special locations. Pause there. I hope you realize that wood doesn't have to go through heat. Anything that will be formed of gold has gone through the fire. So the question is, do you want to stop before you get to glazing? You can choose to be wood. You can choose to be clay. But the scripture says, the expensive utensils are used for special locations. The gold, silver, they're used for special locations. And the cheap ones are for everyday use. 21, if you keep yourself pure, if you make sure your lump of clay doesn't have impurities, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. If you surrender yourself, your life today, the clay of your life, the Lord will take it, he will mold it and turn it into a masterpiece. With heart and nothing 